Welcome to WIPOD Arbitration and Mediation Matters, the WIPO Arbitration and Mediation Center's podcast on intellectual property and innovation disputes. My name is Celine, and thank you for listening, as this podcast aims to provide practitioners a deeper understanding of the use of alternative dispute resolution mechanisms, for example, mediation and arbitration, for such disputes. Today, we are delighted to have with us Dev Ganji, Leandro Toscano, and Oscar Suarez to discuss dispute resolution trends for copyright and content-related disputes in the digital environment. Dev Ganji is a professor of intellectual property law at the University of Oxford. He is also one of the primary writers of the WIPO MCST survey report on alternative dispute resolution mechanisms for business-to-business digital copyright and content-related disputes. Additionally, Leandro Toscano and Oscar Suarez are lawyers at the WIPO Arbitration and Mediation Center and have contributed to the development and publication of the survey report. Thank you, Deb, Leandro, and Oscar for joining us today. Leandro, if you would, please take us away. Thank you for your kind introduction, Celine. You know, in recent years, WIPO Arbitration and Mediation Center has seen a marked increase in copyright and content-related mediation in arbitration cases. For example, in 2021, copyright cases represented 41% of the WIPO ADR caseload. So we often see in WIPO cases disputes that are related to audiovisual and musical works, mobile applications, photographic works, social media platforms, software, and video games, among others. Hi, Celine. Hi, Leandro. Hi, Dev. Thank you for having me here. I just wanted to say that to add to a fact-based understanding of this topic across industries, the WIPO Center, with the support of the Ministry of Culture, Sports, and Tourism of the Republic of Korea, has recently published the results of an international survey on the use of ADR mechanisms for business-to-business digital copyright and content disputes. And and we can see here, not surprisingly, that actually there's a great support for the use of ADR in this digital environment. Hi, Dev. Welcome to our podcast. Thank you for being with us today. You know that the WIPO Center, with the support of MCST, conducted an extensive survey on the use of ADR to resolve digital copyright and content disputes. And you are one of the authors of the report on that survey. Do you consider whether there has been a change in the use of ADR to resolve copyright and content disputes in the digital environment? Thank you, Leandro, for having me. And it was a pleasure to work on the report together with WIPO. And I think the short answer to your question is yes, there has been a change. And what kind of change? Well, very simply more of an appetite or an interest in ADR for B2B copyright disputes. And we looked at a very specific slice of disputes in the report. And that has to do with business to business, digital copyright and content related disputes. So Why do I think that, or why does our report suggest that there has been a change? Well, first to begin with, there's the survey response results. There's a lot of appetite and interest amongst respondents for ADR options and solutions for these kinds of disputes. Then there's the the few statistics that we have. So that's from the WIPO AMC Center, from statistics in Korea, South Korea as well. We've got figures suggesting that more of these disputes are finding their way to ADR solutions. You're then having nudges by the judiciary towards ADR. So some of these are part of a broader trend. So, for example, in 2017, the Court of Justice of the EU decided that within the consumer protection context, you can have mandatory mediation as a first step before allowing consumers to access courts if they do have a dispute in a consumer protection context. So the general direction of travel for courts seems to be favoring ADR, and there are some specific IP references as well. And then in legislation, as our report documents, there's a lot of specific types of copyright disputes where legislation mandatorily requires or very strongly encourages ADR solutions like mediation or like arbitration. Another piece of evidence we saw was IP offices, so a lot of national IP offices 
uh, offering ADR services or facilitating ADR in a range of ways. And then the final sort of piece of evidence we discovered was a number of practitioner associations, so IP practitioner associations, inter, AIPPI, they're setting up specialized groups within the association with an emphasis on ADR and an interest in ADR solutions. So there's a lot of evidence to suggest that there is an interest in ADR for these kinds of disputes. Thank you, Dev, for those first insights. And going back to the survey report, could you share with our audience the key findings of the survey? Sure, I'd be happy to do that. So we did two things in that. We ran a survey with a very large number, almost a thousand respondents. And then we did in-depth qualitative interviews for a very significant proportion of those respondents to get expertise and in-depth commentary, which then enriched the report. A number of interesting things came up. I think for a start, we were very happy to see the range and relevance of the respondents. So we had law firms, we had governments, we had collective management organizations who manage rights on behalf of copyright right owners. We had content owners or their representatives. We had industry associations. And all of these came together to give us a, quite a rich range of perspectives on the questions we were asking. We also had a very good geographical spread. So we had respondents from Europe, Latin America, Asia, North America, Africa, Oceania. So really across the globe, we had people responding to this. Another very valuable thing for us in terms of the quality of the responses was between 10 and 15 percent of respondents had arbitration or mediation experience. So you had quite a, a number of respondents with specific IP ADR expertise who were responding to this. 49% were legal professionals, so they had a sense of some of the legal issues. And 61% of our respondents had prior involvement in business copyright disputes. So it's a very relevant field of responses that we had. And then there are further insights which emerge in terms of the kinds of disputes they've had experiences with in terms of copyright content. 57% of the disputes were contractual and 67% of the disputes were domestic. It gives us an insight into where these disputes are happening, who's sort of participating in them, and something about the nature of these disputes. So in terms of the nature of the disputes, we had interesting categories of subject matter, so things you would expect, musical works, music in general, software. Software was sort of a big category. Advertising materials, literary works, books, kind of printed matter as well. And then films, photos, sorts of things you would expect online but also databases. So databases is an interesting category which features there. And then apps for mobile phones, as well as TV formats. So you can see things which have commercial value, but are not really mainstream, uh, sort of otherwise in copyright discourse. You see these featuring in the survey responses as well. I'll just end by saying a couple of interesting things about some of the kinds of contractual issues and non-contractual issues which emerged from the qualitative interviews when we actually sat down and talked to people, what were the kinds of insights they shared with us. So for software, for example, one of the contractual disputes that arose was when you commission programmers to write code for you or you ask them to update code for you, you need to be clear about the ownership implications of that code which is written because otherwise it lends itself to disputes arising. And in terms of non-contractual disputes, lots of increases in digital and online disputes, so entire web pages where the content is taken or the layout being taken as well. And as you would expect, the effectiveness of platforms or mechanisms like notice and takedown to get rid of infringing content. So there's lots else that's interesting in the report in terms of amounts and, and types of disputes, but I'd be happy to come back to that in another question. Thank you, Dev. And based on such findings, do you think ADR is becoming more relevant for digital copyright and content-related disputes? Again, I think the answer, and listening quite closely and putting the data together, the answer is yes, because of where this particular slice of disputes is situated. So digital copyright issues have huge commercial relevance. If you've been following the news, you've just seen Microsoft has bought over Blizzard, and some of the thinking around why that's happened is because Blizzard and the gaming industry in general is plugged into virtual worlds, and the big buzz now is about the metaverse and you know the blending of reality and virtual reality. And video games have been a sector where this is, you know, virtual worlds has long been a part of video games. So that seems to be the future direction of travel, and it's already games are hugely commercially significant. My sense is they're more valuable than films as a category of, of cultural products. 
So from ebooks to music to films, much of our cultural world is consumed and shared and enjoyed online. And so therefore, this was a good slice to look at. Because it's business to business, what is evident as you dig in is the parties vary in size and sophistication. So you could have an individual photographer as a professional and a big corporation on the other side. So there is, you know, both parties aren't equally well situated and well funded all the time, even though they're both commercial parties. And so therefore, ADR is a way of balancing out access to dispute resolution when you have that imbalance or mismatch. Another issue which comes up quite frequently is these disputes tend to straddle or to span different jurisdictions where you've got perhaps different rules operating and then choosing in advance which rules are going to govern the dispute is a very helpful thing to have. And that's what ADR allows. ADR is increasingly adopting a broader trend. And you see this in mainstream litigation as well. And that is online dispute resolution. And the pandemic has just accelerated the adoption of online dispute resolution. So that's another trend driving people towards ADR, where you have ADR well set up to use online dispute resolution tools. And I know WIPO's got online docket sort of tools and dispute resolution tools as well. And then in the business to business context, because we were looking at business to business copyright disputes, preserving confidentiality is important. But I think more than that, preserving the relationship is also important as well. You don't want the perhaps more unforgiving and adversarial approach to litigation. You want to resolve a dispute that carry on being business partners. And ADR perhaps facilitates that more. And it also lends itself to speed. If it's well designed, it lends itself to speed. And you can select experts to help you decide the dispute. So all of these suggest that, and this is the evidence that suggests that these are the reasons why people are turning to ADR for these disputes. Dev, in the report, it is quite evident that in many countries, copyright legislation already includes references to ADR mechanisms. Could you give some examples of recent copyright legislative developments that also include specific references to ADR? Sure. In fact, I think we were surprised when we were working on the report in terms of just the range and, and variety and spread of national copyright legislation, which for certain types of disputes nudges people towards ADR solutions. So we found evidence in Japan. We found it in Korea dating back to 1987, in Mexico, Nigeria. But I think Singapore is a jurisdiction that I remember from the report. Because you've got the Intellectual Property Dispute Resolution Act of 2019, which more broadly facilitates ADR processes for IP, including copyright. So that was a structural or an environmental change which facilitated accommodating IP disputes. And I think the other recent development that's got a lot of attention is the EU's Digital Single Market Directive. And the DSM is really something which has updated the EU copyright rules really for the internet age and the current wave of internet developments that we find ourselves in. So Article 13 of the DSM, for example, says that where there's a contractual licensing dispute, then mediation is a proposed solution. Articles 19 to 21 of the DSM say that, for example, if there's a contractual relationship between an author of a work and somebody they've sold their rights to who's exploiting or distributing the work for them, then there's a contract adjustment provision if the work does better than expected. So if the work is a bestseller or a better than expected seller, there is a way of adjusting the contractual price paid. And there is a voluntary ADR procedure, which is required by Articles 19 to 21. And that is another area where the BSM directive is encouraging or nudging people to consider ADR options in the copyright dispute space. But perhaps the most interesting development and one of the most controversial in recent times has been Article 17, which imposes duties on large-scale online service providers, online content service providers, to either seek a license in advance from right holders or provide content moderating mechanisms or filters on their platforms. And then if there's a dispute arising from that filtering process, at the tail end of that dispute process, ADR seems to emerge again as one of the options. And because platforms are now ubiquitous, and because disputes happen in large numbers when they happen, this sort of scaling up and ADR being recommended as an option is a very interesting and challenging view of So you mentioned the European Directive on the Digital Single Market. Could you maybe elaborate on the reference to ADR included in the text of the directive? 
be sure I'd be happy to. So Article 17 seems to set up an obligation upon these platforms, which says either get a license in advance from right holders or their representatives, or else in order to avoid liability, you have to set up some kind of algorithmic filters or automated mechanisms to go seeking out infringing content and then doing something effective to remove that sort of content. And blocking is what comes to mind. So automated blocking of such content. Invariably, as past experience has sort of shown, where you've got these automated filtering algorithms, you could end up inadvertently blocking content which is non-infringing or which might be infringing, but which has a defense or an excuse or an exception applying to it, like a parody, for example, of a song. And in those circumstances, the person who's uploaded the content, which is allegedly infringing, should be able to push back against the claim. And the platform then, so the automated filter blocks the content. There is a dispute over whether it should be blocked or not. And then the uploader pushes back against the charge that it's infringing. And then the platform has to make a decision. Presumably a human being who works for the platform has to make a decision about whether it's infringing or not. And once that decision is made, so let's call it a second level decision. The first level automated decision happens by the filter. The second level decision happens by a human employee of the platform. And then if either party, the right holder or the uploader, is aggrieved with that decision and disagrees with it, they should be able to take it to a speedy mechanism. And it's here that Article 17 seems to be suggesting that ADR should be a solution. Before we finish this interview, in the last chapter of the WIPO MCST report, we can find ADR practical applications. For example, WIPO model submission agreements specifically drafted to facilitate the referral of digital copyright and content related disputes to either WIPO mediation or WIPO arbitration. We can also find references to the recently developed WIPO expert determination procedure to resolve user uploaded content disputes in the context of Article 17.9 of the European Directive. Could you share your views on these various developments? I think the first in terms of the model submission agreement, my sense of talking to practitioners and barristers who are involved here in the UK in IP ADR processes, my sense is they find this very helpful and they find it very helpful because it's something they can point to. So where you have even people who are drafting agreements, at that stage, it's very helpful to have these templates almost as a set of references, which people can incorporate into the paperwork into their agreements in advance. I think related to that is the question of making sure that user groups and associations, authors groups, photographers, publishers, musicians, people who you who create copyright content are aware of these provisions. So then they can start through associations and representative groups, be made aware that these provisions exist, start folding them within their regular sort of contracts, and that's how these these templates, like the WIPO model submission green, will tend to circulate and then get embedded in the actual contracts and the actual paperwork. So I think it's it's very important to have them and, and now making sure they travel widely and they're advertised. I think that that is something that people would like to see happen a little more. The second development is WIPO's quite brave experiment to build an ADR system to respond to the Article 17 situation we were just talking about and WIPO's expert determination procedure to resolve these kinds of user-uploaded content disputes is quite a brave experiment because it's, it's new, it's different from the past experience with the UDRP for domain names, and it's going to be happening quite a bit at scale here. So I think one of the interesting things that WIPO is doing is developing a fairly tightly defined catalog of exceptions like parodies or commentary or reviews or criticism. And if you fit within one of the exceptional categories, then that's a starting point for saying that the uploader should be allowed to upload the content. One of the follow-on developments is going to be to then fill out each of these categories in maybe jurisdiction-specific ways. So how a U.S. court might read a parody, for example, because it has a very generous freedom of speech or fundamental right, a right to freedom of expression might be different from how another country might read a parody where it's perhaps got a less generous approach to free speech kind of argument. Thank you, Dev. And it's also important to highlight that parties to dispute will have the chance to go to the national courts to resolve these type of disputes too. 
I think that's a very important. So it, therefore, the quality of the procedure, it gives parties a speedy resolution of a dispute. And my sense is there is a genuine interest and an appetite in ADR in the IP space because parties are seeing the value of a high quality decision with perhaps maybe some compromises in the step to enter into an ADR process but then savings on costs, savings on time, and a result that parties can be happy with. And provided they're happy with that, then the dispute stops at that level. And if they're not happy with it, they can always take it back to the formal court system. So I think that's important to remember as it's always going to be there's a next step. But I think parties in general, in the sectors in which ADR works well, they tend to be happy. So my sense is most of the UDRP decisions don't get appealed to court. They sort of stop there, even though they could be appealed in principle to court as a trademark dispute. Thank you very much, Dev. It's always a pleasure to hear your views and to learn from your vast experience. Thank you, Dev. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And thank you for listening. Don't forget to subscribe as we come out with new episodes every month. For more information on WIPO's alternative dispute resolution services, you may visit the WIPO Center's website or follow us on LinkedIn.